fiction specialist. I'm Bob Weathers. Odie Martinez. I'm really happy to be with you. Uh, gl glad for you to join us today. Uh, if you've uh, been following us uh, for the last several weeks, an introduction won't be necessary. If this is new, let me introduce myself briefly, and I'll introduce Odie along, uh, along with our uh, in-the-studio producer today, Austin Armstrong. Uh, I'm Bob, and uh, uh, clients oftentimes call me Dr. Bob, which in the, in the realm of recovery has a humorous aside because one of the founders of AA uh, was uh, a man who went by the name Dr. Bob, and so some people feel like that I'm old enough to be him. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, I like, I, it's actually kind of tongue-in-cheek, I like Dr. Bob, works just fine for me. Dr. Bob and Bill W., and I'm Bob W., uh, my background's in psychology. I, I, I currently work uh, part-time as a, as a professor of clinical psychology at a local online university, California Southern University. I was actually working this morning on several dissertations. I, I supervise doctoral dissertations by students, most of which, they're all in uh, clinical psychology. Most of, most of them center around addiction and recovery, so I uh, very much enjoy uh, the, the work that I'm doing right now. I was just looking at a dissertation last night that is looking at uh, addiction in the context of socioeconomic status and looking at how being uh, low in socioeconomic status as well as being high in socioeconomic status creates uh, certain risk factors for addiction. And so mm -hmm. that's an example of, of a dissertation and that was my first reading of it. I'm looking forward to reading what this uh, student will come up with. So that's uh, part of what I do. Most of what I do is I work as a recovery coach. And what that means is I work with individuals. This is 80% uh, uh, of what I do each week is I work with individuals, uh, families, and groups uh, in and around issues of addiction and, and recovery. Uh, most people I work with are uh, recovering from very severe substance addictions such as uh, heroin and methamphetamine. Uh, I really enjoy this work. I think about 90% of my work, I was thinking of it today, I think about 90% of my work with people that are in recovery themselves uh, has uh, evolved towards being working with men. And we'll be talking mm -hmm. about uh, some things that are specific to males today for sure. I certainly work with family members, uh, husbands and wives and, and children, et cetera, and parents um, on a weekly basis. And I, I, I feel very... Um, grateful for the work that I do. For those of you that have seen this before, you'll know this, that, that uh, I'm in recovery from addiction, and that has definitely taken my psychology background. I've been in psychology for uh, a little over 40 years now. It's taken that back, and I got addicted in midlife. It's taken that background in terms of my studies and my clinical work to a whole nother level mm -hmm. to really uh, know addiction as well as to be embracing recovery from the inside. So uh, that's a little bit about me. Odie and, and Austin uh, produce each week in the studio our podcast. You can't see Austin Armstrong, although sometimes we turn the camera towards him. He's here working away diligently. And I want to thank you, Austin. I want to thank Beginnings Treatment Center and Therapy Cable for sponsoring our weekly podcast. And Odie works with Austin here. And, and Odie's able to wear multiple hats, including being the co-star of our show. <laughs> so... Uh, Next week, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Austin will be out of town, and Odie will be uh, doing it. He'll be handling all of the production, and I'll be uh, speaking to you and making side references to Odie, I'm sure of it. <laughs> uh, uh, but I really appreciate Odie's joining me here each week. It really has enlivened uh, for the last six months our conversations to be here together, and he's agreed to join me again today. So thank yeah. you, Odie. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Um, last, last week, actually the last two weeks, <coughs> We focused on uh, the role of create creativity in, in terms of our, our uh, 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 growing and healing and our recovery. Last week we had the distinct honor of having one of our regular guests, Angela McLeod, Angela McLeod from, from Bellingham, Washington, joined us last week at a distance and it was a wonderful thing to have you with us, Angela. Thank you. Really appreciate your presence. Uh, she embodies not only recovery, but also creativity in service of recovery. And it was just really, um, uh, really a boon uh, to our program to have you with us. So thank you again. If you weren't here last week and didn't get a chance to see that, that was the second part of a two-part series on living creatively in recovery. And it was Angela's feedback after the first podcast that necessitated her joining us last week. And, and I think that if you, if you have a chance to review our last two weeks podcasts, you'd be well served in terms of looking at the, I, I think, the inseparable linkage between 
soulful creativity and and uh, really looking at uh, recovery from a holistic or an integral perspective. And so uh, I, I direct you towards those. You, by the way, you can resource uh, uh, all previous podcasts in a number of different locations. Uh, you may have joined us today through the Facebook group, Ask an Addiction Specialist. Um, there are links there. You can go directly to YouTube and look up Ask an Addiction Specialist or my name, and uh, you'll find uh, tons of resources online. We have, uh, today I counted, I think this is our first 53rd episode today, so we have over a year uh, in the bank. Thank you, Austin. He's nodding his head because he's been here part of every one of those, and Odie's been here for, for uh, about two-thirds of those, so mm -hmm. thank you, gentlemen. Uh, also, uh, if you're interested, you can go to one of our uh, sponsors is Beginnings Treatment Centers here in Orange County. I'm just coming from having led a men's group uh, at Beginnings uh, here uh, in Costa Mesa. Beginnings has uh, a whole uh, section of their website devoted to educational material podcasts. So look up Beginnings Treatment Centers and then go to the podcast and you'll find them listed there, all of the, all of the podcasts that we've done. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, recommend those to you. You know, I get new clients referred to me. Um, if not every week, every month, I get new clients that I see here locally or many clients I meet uh, uh, via Skype uh, or Zoom technology because we're at a distance. And I always recommend that they go to our, our, our website because it's such a treasure trove of important information. And I do feel like that, that if we're going to talk about working with addiction and recovery holistically, that, that includes uh, exercising the mind with good material and I'm biased, but I think this is great material. So I recommend, I recommend for sure uh, that you that you access uh, 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 those those websites. Um, almost every week, I'll introduce uh, significant figures in the field of recovery, or contributors, particularly from from the psychological domain, that have something to say. I will today. I'll oftentimes mention books and sources, and so I'm constantly peppering our presentations with material that I think is worth tracking down. And so you can go back to virtually any uh, of our presentations and find me mentioning several individuals whose work, oftentimes I'll show their photograph, I'll give their name. You can go online and look up their, their resources and there's just a ton of good material out there that, that I, I feel like it's one of the services that I and we can offer is just as a clearinghouse for good information uh, in regards to addiction and recovery. So. Okay, so that's a bit of an introduction, a little bit of a, 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 a backdrop for today. Today's topic, we're going to be focusing on anger and resentment in recovery. Um, for anybody who's had any exposure to the 12-step uh, process, whether uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, or Al-Anon, Naranon, uh, you'll be well familiar that there's a lot of, of conversation in working the steps of, of uh, working the 12 steps of making sure to root out and heal resentments. These are seen as <clears throat> central kind of uh, barriers to successful recovery. So I feel like it'd be worth our digging deeply into looking at uh, anger and resentment today, uh, how to identify it. And today is also part of a kind of a two-part series. I said next week that Odie will be producing in the studio. We'll be following up next week with, with some real practical suggestions about what to do um, in terms of addressing the roots of anger and resentment. But I felt like today what we need to do is at least sketch out the territory. And so we'll do that by means of some material I'll pre present. I'll be reviewing a little bit of material that we've talked about before, uh, introducing new material. Odie and I will be in dialogue. We'll have an exercise later in the podcast today. And then I'll bridge uh, uh, at the very tail end, I'll bridge what we've covered today to where we plan to head next week, actually the next couple weeks. So uh, that's 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 an overview of where we're headed. I want to invite you, as always, to uh, feel free to interact with Odie and I. You can do that in real time by by writing in um, uh, your questions or comments. Austin is happy to to feel those, and he he's our moderator. He'll communicate those to us. I see a big empty screen right now that's just waiting to have your pearls of wisdom, your questions, your dialogue. I love that very much, Odie, and I love uh, responding to you. So please, uh, please do write, and you can do that through Facebook. You can do that through YouTube. You can communicate directly, and Austin will get those to us. So invite you to submit your questions. Okay, <clears throat> by, wick of, by way of quick review, uh, uh, something that we've talked about a lot, and I, I, I repeat this oftentimes uh, 
uh, uh, in the groups that I lead here locally in, in various treatment centers, is that when you're talking about um, um, active addiction and or how to sustain recovery, particularly in its earliest phase, uh, phase the earliest days of recovery, the number one trigger for relapse for someone in early recovery, the number one trigger for relapse is stress. In fact, from a psychological perspective, the num number one precipitating factor for active addiction is stress. And stress uh, is defined uh, very individually. What is stressful for Odie may be different than what's stressful for Bob. Mm -hmm. What's stressful for Bob may be different than for Austin. But all of us deal with stress in terms of things that, that uh, uh, create our worries, our anxieties, our frustrations. And as these build up, actually the biology uh, of stress is that as these build up, there are stress hormones released in the body. The two central ones that we've talked about are cortisol, not to be mistaken with cortisone. Somebody last week shared with me that they, 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 thought, they thought that cortisol was an ointment that you rub on your <laughs> aching body, and that would be cortisone. So cortisone and cortisol uh, are different. Cortisol is one of the, the hormones in the body that as, as we get stressed, there's, there's more release of this. It ends up being a very motivating chemical. It motivates us to act. Mm -hmm. It really is tied into the fight or flight reaction of responding to uh, uh, a threat. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing. You don't, want, you, you don't want to have low cortisol in those situations. The problem with it is if it's sustained, it's quite corrosive. So it ends up being the kind of thing that leads, for example, to ulcers and other medical conditions is that excess cortisol in the system will manifest physically. And it certainly manifests emotionally. And this can, this can take different routes depending on the individual. Mm. Um, uh, cortisol can lead uh, maybe most obviously to higher anxiety but it's also correlated with, uh, with depression as well and highly correlated with addiction. So mm -hmm. stress, elevated cortisol, number one trigger for relapse. And then if we bring it into the realm of psychology and look at human emotions, the most stressful human emotion, which how that's assigned is by looking at which emotion is associated with the highest elevation of cortisol. And that emotion has been the focus of many of our podcasts. That emotion is shame. So shame of all the human emotions, sadness, anger, uh, fear, all, all of these emotions are associated with elevations in cortisol, and that's the unpleasant quality associated with those emotions. But shame takes the cake, so to speak. It's the highest, uh, highest cortisol uh, associated with it. We've defined shame in different ways here. Technically, the way that psychology defines shame is twofold. Shame is an emotion that's the result of one of two threats, um, and it can be either or both. Uh, the first threat is a threat to social acceptance. You think about this practically. If, you're, uh, if you've experienced rejection by someone or by a group, mm -hmm. the feeling that oftentimes is associated with that rejection is shame. Uh, the flip side of shame, and this would be the second threat, is a threat to self-esteem. Is, is not only have we been rejected by a group, but we feel bad about ourselves. In fact, you can see how those are linked. It's hard to be rejected by a group or by somebody that matters to you and it not go into a self-esteem uh, place. I was just talking recently to somebody who uh, lost uh, their, uh, their uh, job. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, it was owing to addiction. Mm -hmm. and, and as we discussed this, this individual was saying that, that on, on top of the loss, this would be a threat to social acceptance. Mm -hmm. They're not having me come back. Is that that in this person's uh, words, uh, 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 he took a hit to his self-esteem, and he mm -hmm. was able to uh, link those two directly. It's like I lost the job, and it's hard for me not to feel bad about yeah. myself. And that's a very normal response. Mm -hmm. So that's that's in, sh uh, in brief. That's shame. But we're here today to talk about anger and resentment. So why the heck is Dr. Bob talking about shame? <laughs> I'll tell you this is that if I ask most people, and if you think about this for yourself, if I ask most people that I see, or for that matter, just socially, if I ask people, do they walk, do, do they, how would they, uh, how would they self-assess around shame in terms of threats to, to show social acceptance, threats to so self-esteem? Most people will say they don't have a problem with shame. Hmm. In fact, a lot of people will say they don't, they don't, they, they don't even know what shame is. They don't, they don't, other than maybe a, a temporary embarrassment, you know, yeah. a moment where they've yeah. been embarrassed, most people walking around would not acknowledge that they're aware of shame. Now, why would that be, Odie? Why would most people say they're not aware of being ashamed? Any thoughts about that? I would have to guess that maybe because it's a certain emotion that they might confuse it with another emotion. 
You must have read my notes. Did you read my notes? I did not. No. <laughs> okay. I glanced right now, maybe yeah, subconsciously. Yeah, yeah. My brain's no, like, I'm, just, I'm just teasing <laughs> you. It gets mixed up a lot. And let me let me respond. That's great. That's great. Thanks, Odie. It gets mixed up a lot. And I'll tell you, because 90% of my work is with men. I'm most used to dealing with this with men. So when I sit in a group of men, mm -hmm. and as I define shame the way that I just said, so imagine that you, Odie, uh, Austin, and I are sitting here in a group of a dozen other men. Mm -hmm. And I introduce the idea of shame, and then I say, I've stopped asking this question because the answer is typically, I'll, I'll say, do you guys recognize this in yourself? So most guys will say, no. Mm. No, I don't, I don't have any shame. Uh, and, and I don't want to generalize this to women because I don't work with women in, in groups. I do work with women sometimes in families, but I don't work with women. So I'll, I'll have to leave that. When I lead men's groups, for example, at the treatment center, it beginnings today, at the same time, there's a woman leading the women's group. And so mm -hmm. I'd like to consult with them because I think there's a different entry point into this by virtue of gender. Mm -hmm. And while it's not always true, some of the stereotypes or some of the ways you might imagine this probably have some accuracy. So I can say this much, when I ask a group of men if they mm -hmm. struggle with shame, out of a group of a dozen, maybe one person will say that, but most people say they don't. And they're mm -hmm. not lying, they're just not aware of it. Mm -hmm. And so this gets at what you're saying is that <laughs> if, if they're not aware of it, and if it's going on, and think of this, I'm dealing with men in early recovery from addiction. Mm -hmm. So they certainly have experienced rejection from somebody, mm -hmm. from a boss, from a partner, from a family member, and yet they're saying, I don't feel shame, I don't know yeah. what that is. If, if I ask that same group of people, how many of you have a short fuse around anger? 100% will raise their hand. <laughs> and so what I want to talk about today is the linkage. It's an indirect linkage between shame on the one hand mm -hmm. and other, uh, other avenues. I'm going to call them disguises. Ways that shame can disguise itself. And we're going to be focusing today on a couple of those, namely anger and resentment. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about kind of why, where, for, and how does it come to be that way. But let's start with that. Let me, let me say something before I move, move much further. Um, I didn't write this into the PowerPoint slides for today, but, but uh, I, uh, two of the, the current commentators in psychology that I believe are both brilliant in terms of, of studying shame. Uh, they're both females. Their, their first names are both Patricia. Uh, uh, Patricia or Pat Gennotti, uh, G-I-A-N-O-T-T-I, and Pat DeYoung, D-E-Y-O-U-N-G. Uh, um, have, have both written right into, in, into the current year, writing about shame, and both of them are acknowledging that most of the time shame operates outside of our awareness. Mm -hmm. And they're saying this more generally, so I don't think that's a gender thing. I think the manifestation, what disguise it takes might be gender-based. Mm. Um, but, but certainly it's operating out of our awareness. And so to ask somebody, are, do you deal with shame, is to ask somebody to acknowledge something like, do you know what the backside of your head looks like? So, well, you know, we have a mirror, but outside of that, we don't have direct access mm -hmm. to that. Most of us don't walk around with, we're, we're, um, I picked that because most of us aren't aware of our shadow. Mm -hmm. What psychology calls our shadow, why it's called shadow is that it's oblique to us. We don't see our shadow, mm -hmm. you know, if you think yeah. about it. Ever tried to look at your shadow and you move to the side and you move to the side and every time you move, the shadow moves with you. <laughs> That's the way it is with shame. So... What I'm going to suggest today is that while it operates out of awareness, there are indirect indicators of our, of our struggling with shame, and I'm going to suggest that we look at anger and resentment. Whether you're male or female today, let's look at this in your own life and see how it may or may not apply. Mm. So let's ask a question. Why, why anger and resentment? Why would that be a primary disguise for, uh, for a shame? Do you have any thoughts about that? Why, why would we so oftentimes go towards anger or aggression, let's say, rather than acknowledge being ashamed. Do you have any thoughts about that, Odie? I would, uh, yeah, I think that with, um, with anger, you know, mm -hmm. and resentment, maybe there's something in, in somebody's past mm -hmm. that they're angry about or mm -hmm. resentful mm -hmm. towards mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they feel ashamed about, but they don't know how to... I think you're on the um, right track. I think you're on the right track there. Yeah, I have it in my mind, but it's just... Uh, <laughs> it's difficult for them to express or to admit yes. the root cause yeah. of what they're feeling. In fact, it's it's difficult to admit it because it's so vulnerable. Okay. It, you know, you think yeah. about it. If, if, and, and I like the way that you put that. I can have something in my past that I feel vulnerable around shame, and I certainly do. And to approach it is to, is to join in that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And whether I'm male or female, I'll be talking as a male. Mm 
I've been socialized from birth on mm -hmm. not to be weak. Mm. Yeah. And so it feels like weakness. It feels like weakness to, to uh, acknowledge shame. And so most men that I work with will acknowledge that they were raised to have one emotion. Mm. Um, uh, they were allowed to have one negative or unpleasant emotion, and that emotion is anger. Mm. For, a, for, a, for, a boy to, for a boy growing into manhood to be afraid, mm. weak. Right. For a boy to be sad, weak. To a, uh, for a boy to be uh, uh, ashamed, mm. weak. For a boy to be jealous, if you go down the list of emotions, all yeah. of those, the one thing I can be is I can be mad. I can't be sad. I can be mad. And so uh, it, it, it's, it's a way that we've been raised, and that's part yeah. of it. And so when we go to a vulnerable dip somewhere in our life, something that we're ashamed of, uh, we've been trained not to go into, into the weakness of it. I'll tell you who's written the most about this. this is the next slide is uh, the, the uh, uh, doctor of social work, uh, Brene Brown. And many of you in the audience have, have viewed Brene Brown's uh, TED Talks. She's widely available on, on uh, YouTube, and her TED Talks are some of the most uh, widely viewed uh, TED Talks, and she addresses shame around vulnerability with great expertise. What mm -hmm. she says is that the irony of this is that if I approach shame in my past, mm -hmm. the only way that I can heal shame is by myself being vulnerable. The only way I can enter into addressing it is to be vulnerable. Right. And you, so, so if my response is anger, then I don't really get to it, so it never gets healed. Yeah. It reminds me of a doctor needing to lance a wound to get out the infection. Mm -hmm. You just can't put a Band-Aid over the wound and expect it's going to go away. <laughs> you have to actually go down into it. It is mm -hmm. painful to do that, but the alternative is infection and the potential loss of a limb. And yeah. so it's worth doing that. But to do that is, is kind of the opposite of what you would think, especially if you've been uh, raised to believe that to look into shame is, is uh, weakness yeah. that is to be avoided. So let's ask this question. What are some barriers to the kind of vulnerability that Bre Bre Brene Brown is talking about? Let me leave that question for just a second. If somebody's written in a comment. Uh, uh, so we're going to be looking at barriers to vulnerability uh, that keep us away from being able to address shame and actually keep us in a state of anger or resentment. We'll be looking at that in just a minute. But let's see this question. Uh, this is good. I think the feminine counterpoint to anger reaction to shame might be turning in on one's, deflating one's sense of self and falling into self-criticism. That's very helpful. Thank you. I believe that's you, Angela. And if that's you, uh, Austin's nodding. I recognize your thoughtfulness. Thank you. That's good. Thank you so much, Angela. You're our, you're our third uh, co-presenter here <laughs> each week. I really appreciate that. So let me read that. I think the feminine counterpoint to anger reaction to shame might be turning in on oneself, deflating one's sense of self, and falling into self-criticism. So interesting. And it's not, not, uh, uh, it's not Angela, that I as a, a man... Uh, a boy growing into men who don't know about that because it certainly could be self-critical. Um, I wonder how this goes. It, that, that wouldn't be the entry point for mm -hmm. me as a, uh, as a boy growing up. It's not that I, I couldn't, it's not that I wouldn't go into uh, uh, criticizing myself, but I would never show it to Odie. Mm -hmm. I would yeah. never show it to Odie, so it would be very private. And I, uh, um, And so I, I'll get to this next question. So, so I'm just aware that, that I'm, I'm trying to remember, there's a way that there's a psych, psych, psychologist, Karen Horney, who talked about this, is that some people move against, and aggression moves against, mm -hmm. and, and some people move away. And I would think that that self-criticism is like moving away and into oneself, kind of down into mm -hmm. oneself. Yeah. Whereas as a boy growing into manhood, I was socialized to move out against, to aggress. Uh, I think aggression actually comes from the Latin root, which just means to move forward. And so there's a forward movement rather than mm -hmm. a down and, and into. Um, I think of this oftentimes in the groups I lead, Angela, where I have men who are uh, exceptions in the group because they're self-reflective. Yeah. Most of us as men, we kind of act out the process. We don't move into an internal process. And my sense of many females, and probably this is, matches your experience, Angela, is that there's been much more room to be self-reflective, and unfortunately, a shadow side of that might be to be self-critical, mm. and that's just not only uh, uh, my sense of, of my experience as a male, nor of the men that I work with. Uh, there's a second comment. So are you saying that shame can be misinterpreted as resentment and anger? Uh, 
Or, or are you saying that shame can be manifested into fear and resentment? I'm just letting the question go in for just a second. I think I'm saying both. I think I'm saying both. And I think <laughs> as we move uh, deeper into the presentation, it will become clear. But, I mean, you're right on track here. I think that uh, here's a way to think about it. If you think about shame as being a primary emotion, that is to say that I feel bad about myself, I feel threatened. Right. That's the primary foundation. What you may see, and this would be the first part, what you might see instead of shame would be resentment or anger. And you could say, Bob's angry all the time. And that would be a secondary emotion. The secondary emotion is really a cover for the primary emotion. Mm. The primary emotion never gets expressed. Mm. And so you could misinterpret me as being angry, and I've got a problem with anger, which wouldn't be untrue. It just wouldn't go deep enough. Because mm. really the root of Bob's problem with anger could be uh, it could be shame. So, it would, yes, it would be misinterpreted. Actually, it would be misinterpreted not only by those that view it, but by the person who's that. Mm. So if I'm walking around angry all the time, I may think, well, I've got an anger problem, not realize. No, really what I have is a self-esteem problem. <laughs> yeah, I have, a, I have a shame problem. The second part of your question, or am I saying that shame can be manifested into fear and resentment? We're really going to be focusing on anger and resentment here, and I would say absolutely. Absolutely. So both are the case. I think it can it can be that shame doesn't have a proper way to vent itself, a channel for it to express itself, and then it gets misinterpreted. Yeah. In fact, we're going to do an exercise at the end, Angela, that will actually give us a chance to reflect on this, each one of us viewing this. So hang on, hang on. <laughs> so the question, thank you so much for your comments. The question we just asked was, was what are barriers to vulnerability? Um, well, one of them that psychology talks about is Anger and aggression, moving against somebody, rage and resentment, all of these things can keep us feeling glued together. Mm -hmm. That's actually a way that psychology talks about it. Yeah. It talks about it in terms of self-coherence or self-cohesion. Is it a way for me to kind of stay put together when I'm feeling like I'm going to fall apart mm -hmm. is to be pissed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just mad. Yeah. You know? I'm, not, I'm not uncomfortable. I'm not insecure. I just want to kill you. you know? <laughs> and so it glues people together psychologically. I'm saying it lightheartedly. It's just not very fun to be on, the, on either end of it. Yeah. But the fact is, if you think about it, think about a time that you've been righteously indignant. Mm -hmm. Everything is very unified. You're very glued together. I'm right, you're wrong, and I'm going to let you have it. And so there's something about that that for a moment, you used the word earlier, Angela, of deflation. For that moment, you could say, I have an inflated false sense of self. Mm. It's really not truly what's going on because underneath that shame. So right. it's false, yeah. but it's inflated. And so what, me worried? I'm not worried. I'm just going to pound you. You know, that, that, <laughs> That's what aggression will do. Does that make sense? Yeah. Keeps us glued together. So in a time, one of the things that shame does, and Pat DeYoung talks about this. Pat DeYoung is, is one of the two I just uh, mentioned. She wrote a book called Understanding and Treating Chronic Shame. came out in the last couple of years, and it's a masterwork on shame. Uh, the second uh, author is Pat Giannotti, who has a book called Listening with Understanding. And although the title is understandable, the book is very technical. Both mm -hmm. books are technical, but both of them look deeply into what we're talking about right now. And so uh, they'll both look at how uh, anger can keep us, keep, keep us glued together and that shame actually fragments us. That's where I was going with mm -hmm. that. Is that uh, Pat DeYoung actually describes shame. I can't remember verbatim her lengthy definition of shame right now, but it includes that feeling of fragmentation. That's the term she uses. Yeah. And so if you're going to fall apart, what can you do to put all your pieces back together? The reversal of the Humpty Dumpty situation. <laughs> well, ways, one of the most effective ways to do that short term is to move towards anger and aggression. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, that yeah. makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yep. Uh, if you add to that, if you add to that what we've just said, how, how, uh, how good it can feel speaking of righteous indignation, to blame somebody else mm -hmm. rather than to feel shame. So if you just think about how this goes for yourself. When you're feeling vulnerable, if you can rage against the storm, if you can blame somebody else, it effectively gets you, for the short term, effectively can get you off the hot seat of shame. And so there you have a dynamic that, that oftentimes the one uh, blaming is, is him or herself struggling with shame, but there's no focus on them because yeah. they're blaming somebody else. Yeah. So it can be a very effective strategy, and all of us know it because we've all practiced it. There's <laughs> another comment. It's hard to be vulnerable with people who have hurt you or who might shame you. Yes. So I'm only willing to be vulnerable with someone who doesn't do that. 
That's very wise. That's very wise. Yeah. We didn't go deeply into this material. Brene Brown does, but she's very clear in her talking about vulnerability as being the royal road to transformation of healing, of, of shame, uh, the royal road to heal shame, is it really requires being able to be in a trusting relationship with, yeah. with, with somebody, somebody who uh, themselves is not going to take your vulnerability and go into it. Um, we can all think of examples where we've opened ourselves to somebody and then, then later realize it was a mistake. Mm. I think mm. one of the worst experiences for me is that to have somebody store up my having shared something vulnerable and then a day later or a month later or a year later go use that as fodder mm. to attack me. Yeah. It's like, you know, you open up your, your soft underbelly and somebody just stores that away. Yeah. That's, that is not okay. Yeah. <laughs> that is not okay. <laughs> and it's human to do that. And maybe we've all done that. But it's bad faith. It's bad faith to do that. So you're absolutely right, is that to be vulnerable, the root word for vulnerability comes from the Latin term vulnus, which simply means wound. And if I'm going to expose my wound to you vulnerably, mm -hmm. I need to make sure that you're not going to further wound me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 yeah I think another, another part to that is um, that's just as bad as somebody that you show the vulnerability to mm -hmm. and you don't see a reaction to them or they kind of just dismiss it yeah you know they yeah. feel uncomfortable yeah. that you're being yeah. vulnerable so they'll kind of direct the conversation to some results yeah yeah I, yeah I was just speaking today earlier to a client and we were talking about this idea in psychology of mirroring and this is somebody mm -hmm. who grew up not feeling really uh, um, responded to <clears throat> by his caregivers mm -hmm. And uh, psychology uses different terms for this. <clears throat> a more technical term is affect attunement, mm -hmm. is attuning to somebody's emotions. And so, if, for example, if you come to me with shame and I'm not attuned correctly, it's referred to as malattuned. If I'm malattuned mm -hmm. to you, mm -hmm. I'll do just exactly what you talked about. Right. I'll change the subject or I'll miss the depth of what you're saying and I'll, and I'll stay at a superficial level. Mm -hmm. And so to open your heart that way to somebody and have them yeah. respond wrongly or just not at the right level is incredibly painful and ironically it can be further shaming. Mm. It's that now mm -hmm. you, you feel shame, now you feel shame, ashamed of having shared your shame because this person wasn't an adequate container for that. Mm -hmm. and so what we were talking about today, psychology says you want to be with people that effectively mirror. And I love mm -hmm. that image. It's like yeah. if I'm with you and you're sharing something vulnerable, you want me to be with you enough so that when I express my understanding, it's exactly what you're talking about. Mm. That would be effective mirroring. Mm. And sometimes it's not even in words. It can be mm. in a glance. Mm. In fact, I've been aware of this. That, uh, yesterday I led a group. At the end of the group, there was a very touching moment for me with one of the men in the group where we were talking about a certain uh, issue. I can't even recall up the specific uh, issue that it is right now. Right. But we looked at each other, what he was sharing vulnerably, and I was acknowledging that I knew that deeply from the inside. Mm -hmm. And we looked at each other, and both of our eyes teared up. There wasn't a word said. Right, yeah. It was like complete knowing. And it was mutual. Mm. I felt as mirrored by him as I hope he did by me. I trust that he did by me. It's that. It's mm. that. And when that's absent, then what we'll do is we'll want to crawl into a shell. And, and that really is what shame wants us to do. Right, yeah. Shame wants me to crawl into a corner over there and hide. Mm -hmm. And if I reveal myself to you and you don't honor that, mm -hmm. if you're preoccupied or even worse, if you're judgmental and actively aggress, yeah. I want to crawl deep, deep down in a hole is what I want to do. So thank right. you. That's a good point. The point behind this business of anger and resentment, if I, and, and by the way, I'm not saying all anger or all resentment is a function of shame. Mm. I'm just wanting to look at that element of it because we've spent so much time talking about how do we reduce stress? Shame is the, is, is the, the, the uh, single most stressful human emotion and the fact is it gets linked or disguised with anger and resentment some mm -hmm. of the time. And when it gets linked that way, we can miss the fact that that anger and resentment itself becomes a, it's a cloak over the shame and it becomes a trigger for, for relapse. Because yeah. it's really, it's just a very thin veneer over shame. And that shame itself is the primary trigger for relapse in terms of human emotions. But it doesn't look like shame. It doesn't yeah. look like vulnerability. Yeah. It looks like the opposite. It looks like invulnerability because it's angry. It's blaming. The fact is, in a shame state of mind, I want to feel anything but that sense of failure. Yeah. I do not want to feel that shame. So you can see uh, the truth of what you're saying is to be vulnerable uh, requires a tremendous amount of courage. In fact, yeah. uh, I'll skip ahead mm -hmm. here. Brene Brown talks about this in her TED Talks and in her writings and her books. 
is that to be vulnerable requires courage. And she takes the word courage and actually breaks it down to the French root of cur. What's the, what's the Spanish word for heart? Corazón. Corazón. Corazón and cur are related to each other. French word is cur. I don't speak either French or Spanish. <laughs> so here it goes. But cur, which is the root of courage, would be very related to corazón, which is the root of the English word courage. Mm -hmm. By the way, is there a Spanish word for courage that you know? Um, I'm just curious. I'm sure there is, but... I'd be curious to know. To I don't know the French word for courage, there. but I wonder if it's courage. But <laughs> cour is heart. So the fact is, if you think about it, we were just talking about this. Mm -hmm. In order to be vulnerable, you have to open your heart. It takes right. tremendous cour. Mm. It takes tremendous corazón yeah. to open my heart to somebody else. It's a very interesting root of it, isn't it? Yeah. And I honestly, because everything in me wants to avoid that feeling of vulnerability, mm -hmm. I really get when she talks about courage, she's not kidding. Yeah. It takes some serious courage. It also takes a lot of trust. I have to trust oh, yeah. you. You have to trust me to do that. We have basically two options here. Dear audience, we can continue to lash out at others, and a lot of us do that. Some people take up permanent residence there. Mm -hmm. Or we have to find a new way to deal with shame, which is to say that to whatever extent my shame or your shame is being disguised by anger and aggression, we've got to find some way to transform that. And the first steps towards that transformation certainly take opening our hearts, our cour, our corazón, so I want to I want to ask uh, ask of you an exercise. So join me in an exercise for just a minute, and Odie and I will uh, reflect together our, our our answers to the following question. First of all, can you think of a time, maybe even recently, when you blew up at somebody else? That is, you you blew up with anger, you blew mm. up with with scorn, with judgment, with resentment, with blame, and you did that in hindsight as an antidote to your own vulnerability. <laughs> as an antidote to your, your own shame. So a time where you blew up at somebody, lashed out at somebody, and if you didn't realize it in the moment, I think most of us don't, but in, that, in hindsight, you look back on it and you go, holy moly, uh, that was really uh, like a protective maneuver to yeah. keep me from being exposed. Can you think of that? Give yourself a moment to reflect on that. We'll do the same, and then we'll share a couple of instances here. Okay. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, if you didn't get a chance to complete this, I really encourage you to journal this or write this out because it can be very helpful. One of the things about getting shame out on paper is it's one step towards, towards bringing it to the light of day. Shame thrives in darkness. It's kind of like a fungus. <laughs> it thrives in darkness. <laughs> and if you can get it out in the sunlight, it's a step towards being able to heal it. Uh, let's, let's see what we came up with. Do you mind? Do you want to share uh, something that came to mind? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. It's a little bit more on the lighter side of things, but... We can um, use some lightness. Yeah. This is heavy-duty <laughs> stuff. <laughs> but driving down on the highway or on the freeway and uh, not wanting to use my GPS. Oh, boy, can I relate to this? Uh, and um, Speaking of guys. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, my wife saying, are you sure you know where you're going? Mm. Them is fighting words. Yeah. <laughs> and, and me saying yes once, and then her asking again mm -hmm. a couple of minutes later, and me exploding saying, yes, I know where I'm going. I don't need a GPS. Yeah. But yeah, that's... I don't know if this is a universal male <laughs> affliction, but it's a universal Bob and Odie affliction. Yes. I have the same, very same affliction. I, I, uh, I pride myself on having a good sense of direction. I've been told that yep. uh, over the years, whether I do or don't. I'll leave that up to other people to decide. But I have this sense that I can find my way out of a paper bag pretty well. <laughs> and, and some portion of the time, one out of 100 times or maybe whatever, I get, I get turned around. I get lost <laughs> like that. But I'll be the last person to admit it. And yeah. on my car, I, 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 you know, the last several years, cars, when you get a car, they'll have that. In, they'll have mm -hmm. a, uh, what do you call it? GPS. GPS they yeah. call it GPS. Yeah. <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> I've actually asked for them not to put that in my car. The latest car, because I got such a good deal on it, has mm -hmm. one in it. 
Mm. I have not used it once. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a sign of mental instability. <laughs> but I just don't use it. I just yeah. I just operate differently around directions and so on. And and I end up being and the point is is end up being really defensive. For you with your wife, you end up saying right. I, you know, you say in yeah, stern voice, I know. I know exactly where I'm going. This is a perfect example. Yeah, so perfect the shame, example. Yeah, the yeah. shame part of it being shameful that I am lost yeah, and I don't yeah, want to admit yeah, that I'm yeah, lost. Yeah, 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 that's exactly right. Which that kind of has like a double meaning behind it as well if you think mm-hmm. about it with addiction as well. Mm-hmm. You know, you're in addiction, people are lost and yeah. they don't want to admit it as well. Yeah, yeah. So GPS, yeah. addiction. I'm going to use that as an analogy to give somebody <laughs> the group. Yeah, it's one of the hardest things for uh, uh, for many of us, and I'm going to include myself right at the top of the list here. Mm-hmm. In addiction, to be able to do what is talked about in different ways in addiction, but to to, to be able to surrender, mm-hmm. yep. to be able to surrender and acknowledge that I cannot, I, I, this is out of control. I cannot stop this on my own, and this enters in conversations about higher power. Uh, Etc. Mm-hmm. But but to 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 really hit bottom and to realize that I am lost, mm-hmm. lost is really really painful and right. and associated with a lot of shame. Honestly, because of the pain of that, many people will not be able to sustain recovery because it's almost unendurable. Depending on how you're wired, to be able to acknowledge being lost, to rely on others, for G- to rely on a GPS from somebody mm-hmm. else, if it's against your nature, and I can guarantee you it is and was for me made it really dicey early on for me to yeah. be able to stick with recovery because I just I just didn't feel like I was going to be able to let go mm. into into that. And, yeah. and I see that all the time in my work right now. It's not universal, but it's close to it. The examples that I came, I came up with two examples, and I think they're both in the same strand. And I, 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 I appreciate it. I identify with that. Uh, recently, uh, uh, I'm very sensitive to, to people I feel like lecturing me. Mm. Ironically, I've made my living for most of my career by being a lecturer. <laughs> Not that I've ever done it here, of course. No, I, I, I don't like being talked down to. Mm. And I think what it does is it touches something for me that was very early on. I had a reasonably intelligent mother and father who were prone to lecturing me, and I think it made me feel stupid. Mm. The fact is yeah. they were smarter than I was. They knew more than I did as a kid growing up. Mm. And so when anything touches that, it's a raw nerve, and I can lash out with anger. Rather than saying, mm. it makes me uncomfortable, I feel ashamed when you talk this way to me, Odie, I'll, I'll come at you aggressively, mm. and my words can be like daggers. And so that's a sense, that's a raw spot for me. Right. There's another one for me, and it's around finances. If, if, if you question, it's a little bit like GPS on steroids. <laughs> if you question my financial uh, acumen, mm. and I think it's really reasonable to question it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I, I think I'm, I'm really grateful for having made a living, doing right. what I do. I really care about the work that I do and so on. But I've, I've made some mistakes. For example, I'm very, very reliant on an accountant to help me keep accounting straight because mm-hmm. it's not my front yard. Yeah. My first wife was an accountant, and I envied her. She was really, really good at keeping all that stuff. And it's just not, it's not my front yard. Mm-hmm. I'm not even sure it's my backyard. I think it's across <laughs> the street and down the way a little bit. And so the irony is I can sit here with you and I can laugh about it, but the irony that if you were to, if you were to say it with a certain, to- certain tone of voice, mm-hmm. Question yeah. my ability to um, manage taxes or manage, mm-hmm. you know, balancing ledgers and so on. Mm-hmm. I can admit to you right now that I'm not good at it, but on a bad day or at the short, uh, you know, short little tether, I can get very defensive around that. And it's ironic because I know in my heart of hearts that that's not my strong suit. There's a lot of things I'm gifted at, and I'm grateful for those gifts. Finances and keeping all that stuff together, that's just the bane of my existence. Mm-hmm. It's just not. <laughs> Uh, Jung, uh, Carl Jung had a term for this. He called it. He calls it your inferior function. Mm. You have all these things that are your dominant functions, and you have things that are your inferior function. And so, a dominant function might be for you being able to, to have a cognitive map of where you're driving. That's mm. very strong for me. Right. I would not say the same thing about finances. So, if somebody questions questions the map thing for me, I kind of take umbrage. It's like, how dare you? <laughs> if somebody questions me about my finances, I'm kind of guilty as charged. Right, yeah. And it's always been a raw spot for me. Mm. So and that one's come up in the last couple of weeks too. We could probably come up with endless lists yeah, of this, but absolutely. what we're doing is we're making, we're bringing to awareness something that's really common is that you're aware of having a, 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 a tiff, mm-hmm. a disagreement with your wife. The same for me. And underneath it is actually the opposite of aggression. It's a feeling of vulnerability. Mm-hmm. Does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. perfect sense. Second part of this question, I'll ask this of Odie, and you can ask it of me. <laughs> How's that working for you? 
How did it? How did it work to blow up at somebody, bite somebody's head off, as they questioned your your uh, navigational abilities or whatever it might be? And let's just make a quick uh, comment on that right now. I think it's worth our acknowledging that it it's costly. Yeah. That absolutely. that not only not only does it does it not get down to the shame, but actually oftentimes the consequences of these these uh, angry, resentful, aggressive countercharges can actually take a toll on a relationship. Do you want to comment on that? How did it go with your drive? Uh, not too good. <laughs> Same here. <Yeah. laughs> Same here. It didn't go too well. It didn't go too well. Yeah, it reminds me of, yeah, uh, yeah. very quickly, Yeah. Um, as quick as I can anyway. So, you're fine. You're fine. You're okay. Fine. Um, so there's a, there's a story in the Bible of uh, Joshua. He takes the Israelites. He's taken them to conquer different countries. Mm -hmm. And then the, they take over, I think it's uh, Jericho, the walls of Jericho. Mm -hmm. And um, God tells them, okay, go around it seven times, mm -hmm. bring the walls down, mm -hmm. and but don't take anything. This is just for me. The conquering is just for me. Mm -hmm. So they go, they do it, and then they leave. And then they go into another battle, but they start losing their battles, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, the... The leader Joshua asks God in prayer, "What's going on?" I, well, you said we were gonna start winning battles and this right. and that. It's like, well, that's because somebody in your mm -hmm. camp is mm -hmm. took didn't listen to what mm -hmm. I said, so everybody's mm -hmm. paying the price for it. Yeah. So I always think of that story whenever mm -hmm. I lash out like that, mm -hmm. just like, well, it's not only gonna affect me, but mm -hmm. it's gonna affect other people as yeah. well. You know what I mean? Yeah, I like that a lot. So yeah. yeah. That's how it went. Um, you know what this does? Yeah. It really opens up. Thank you. It really yeah. opens up. It's like if I steal something from Jericho, you could say that's really on me and I have to deal with my own shame. Yeah. But the fact is to the extent that I'm not being conscious or, or honest with myself, much mm -hmm. less with my partner, with people in my life, right. it has direct consequence on them too. And yeah, it's, exactly. a story. it's a beautiful story. Thank you. Yeah, it's a beautiful story that really captures it is that uh, our shame becomes not just an intra personal thing it becomes an interpersonal thing mm -hmm. and it has huge consequences so and and our whole conversation today talking about shame and then talking about its derivatives namely uh, uh, anger and resentment mm -hmm. is that these are directly related to addiction and what 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 can be more destructive to a relationship than addiction in the middle of a relationship? Yeah. It's not just the addicted individual that suffers. They do suffer for sure, but it's anybody that loves them suffers mm -hmm. as well. So there's, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. I have an image and maybe, uh, maybe uh, we can bring that up right now. Uh, go right there, that image. Thank you. Uh, of, uh, it's an image of fingers pointing at this woman and and it's and I'm in it in the in the and I I, I I think of this image in two ways. One is what it's what shame feels like to me. Mm -hmm. I, I I am the one with the fingers pointing towards me, but one of the things I can do is that I can shunt that aside and I can be one of those fingers pointing at somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so shame uh, feels awful inside, and sometimes it's so unbearable. That the only way I can deal with it is to displace it by shaming or blaming somebody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, I see this, I'll give you an example, in the, in the treatment settings in which I work, I really counsel against this, but I'll ask, I'll say, are there pecking orders here? And there are, there are pecking orders. It's like, well, I was just addicted to alcohol. You, on the other hand, was addic you were addicted to heroin. Mm -hmm. or, or, uh, or, or sometimes it's like, oh, your addiction was baby stuff. I'm, I'm into the real stuff. It's right. just, the, <laughs> the way that we as human beings will jockey for position, yeah. You know, there's hitting bottom, and then there's levels of bottom. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. <laughs> and I said, can we please get off of that? But this yeah. is the human impulse. If I'm feeling bad about my addiction, well, my addiction isn't as bad as yours, or my, my addiction's cooler than yours, right. as if addictions are cool. Yeah. Gonna, I see that <laughs> all the time. And I think it's something about this image. It's like, if, if I feel judged, if I feel fingers pointing at me, and there's mm -hmm. no individual in recovery from addiction that hasn't felt self-judgment in other people's judgment, then it's all too easy to turn that towards other people with great destruction. Mm, yeah. Let's see, here's another comment. This person said, I pulled out in front of another car and that car blew the horn at me and I blew a gasket that really made me angry because I was ashamed of the fact that I pulled out in front of him and didn't properly drive. Man, do I know that yeah. one. <laughs> that just happened this week. I pulled out and I just misgaged it and this person's behind me. They're ticked off, they're flipping me off and so on. And I'm really right at the edge of doing the same thing back to them. This person goes on to say, I always feel grateful to AA for teaching the practice of pausing before speaking or acting. That pause gives me time to check 
if the anger is disguising shame. That's good. Mm. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Pausing. That's the thing about this, uh, this uh, angry reaction. It's so automatic and so fast. Mm -hmm. The emotional center of our brain, which is right between our ears, the midbrain, it moves quickly. And if we can slow it down by moving things, what you're calling the pause, Angela, if we can move it down to slow it down by running it through the frontal cortex and look at the long-term consequences, like you, for your example, with your wife. Mm -hmm. Yes, you want to lash out at her because she's questioning your GPS ability, et cetera. And if you can even breathe for a second, that's easier said than done, I realize. Exactly. Yeah. But if I can breathe for a second, pause, as, as Angela puts it, then there's a chance to slow it down and possibly not react. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important that we pause if we have done that, pause afterwards, and you were able to do that, and I was too, to pause later to realize that was dirty pool. Mm -hmm. I was actually feeling vulnerable when I yelled at that person. That was not <laughs> cool. That was not cool. Yeah. Okay, so what we've done today is stage one. Next week is stage two. What we've attempted to do today, anyway, is to get, get clear on how shame and addiction um, share many disguises. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and the, the, the one that we focused on today was looking at aggression, anger, resentment, retaliation, is that it shame, uh, anger doesn't look like shame, is a disguise for it. I do want to say this, is I think that, that uh, uh, so much of my work looks at this, is, is that if you look at the outside, if you look at somebody's addictive behavior from the outside, it's easy to judge it. Yeah. I see that you do this, you see that I do that. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes, it's close to being universal. Oftentimes, inside of that addictive cycle of behavior are feelings of shame. Mm -hmm. And the closest you can get to that sometimes is indirectly by seeing anger. So I see yeah. a lot of anger in the rooms mm -hmm. where I work. I don't see a lot of shame. And my goal is to honor the anger for what it is, but to not stop there, to actually go deeper than the anger, to get down to the shame. And oftentimes it's the shame that underlies the addiction. Mm -hmm. If it's yeah. true that shame is the most stressful emotion, kicks up my cortisol the highest, and I know how to balance that out with my addictive behavior, my addictive substance, mm -hmm. then it gets locked into a cycle that's very hard to break. If I don't deal with the shame, yeah. then I don't successfully uh, uh, address the addiction. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, there's good news. The hope is this, is that we start by being able to do what Odie did today and I did today, and Angela, you did this, which is be able to identify our anger as disguised shame. When that's the case, Doing what Angela talked about, slowing the, the, the film down, slide by frame by frame to where we can recognize, wait, 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 wait. This does look like anger, but it's a very thin, filmy veneer over shame. That gives us, that's a good place to start. You can't work on something if you're not aware that it's there. Right, yeah. And the thing about anger is it gets a lot of attention, and shame kind of can recede into the background. It takes a lot of commitment to be able to begin to unearth one's shame. There's a comment up here. One of the good things about my being irritable a lot with my husband is that it gave me lots of practice doing the forgiveness practice and apologizing and mending. <laughs> I really appreciate that. <laughs> Let me reread that. I started laughing. One of the good things about my being irritable a lot with my husband is that it gave me lots of practice doing the forgiveness practice and apologizing and mending. Angela, you've, you've prefigured where we're going next week is that next week we're going to be looking at building self-compassion and we'll be doing forgiveness practice. And uh, I just... I just the group that I met with earlier today, we were talking about how do we forgive ourselves. And, and uh, there was an individual who was saying he's just getting ready to graduate from the program. He just got employed, got a job. He's going to be out in the work sector. And he says, how do we keep ourselves on track with our recovery? And I told them what I do. And I said, one of the things I do every morning is I spend five minutes doing what you what's discussed in the 12-step programs is making amends. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I, I do forgiveness practice virtually every morning as part of my early morning quiet time. And what I told them is that easily 50%, <laughs> it's probably more like 75% of my forgiveness practice, as for you with your husband, Angela, I presume, <laughs> so for me with my wife. And when it's not my wife, it's my daughter. <laughs> and, and so, is that the biggest bulk of the forgiveness is for the people, that you, whenever we yeah. talk, it's about you and your yeah, wife. Exactly. It stands to reason that's who you're closest to. And so when there are, when there are ruptures relationally, when there's, accidentally stepping on somebody's foot or they're stepping on your foot, chances are it's going to be in those intimate relationships. And so I, I laugh when I read what you wrote, Angela, only because it's so close to home, yeah. is that we get lots of practice, don't we? Yeah. One of my favorite books on marriage uh, from a spiritual perspective, I used to require this when I taught 
a marriage and family therapist in the university, it was written by a, a Swiss author. His name is Adolf Guggenbuhl, which is a mouthful, G-U-G-G-E-N-B-U-H-L dash Craig. He was married to Mrs. Craig from Scotland. I went to Zurich years ago and I met uh, uh, Adolf Guggenbuhl Craig and I had uh, tremendous respect for him. He's one of the, he has since passed away. He was one of the early students of Jung and I got a chance to spend an evening with him and his wife. Uh, he's full on Swiss German. His wife was, uh, was uh, Scottish. I remember both of them very well. He wrote a book called Marriage, Dead or Alive. The title, who would want to buy a book with that? <laughs> but the idea of this book that he argues very strongly is that marriage or intimate relationship um, provides the laboratory for us to work towards healing. Mm. It's the day-to-day -day friction. He actually uses the word friction. You're going to appreciate this coming from your Christian perspective. He says, most people enter into marriage looking for harmony. I just want to get along with my partner. Mm -hmm. And what they're looking for is, he, he calls that a decisional marriage. I decide to marry you and we're going to get along, right? right. Peace yeah. at any price. <laughs> and that's fine. But he says some percentage of people actually go to marriage to look for something different. And the word he uses for it is salvation. Hmm. It's translated from German into English as salvation. And what he means by this is that those relationships are characterized by what Angela is writing about, is that when we bump into each other, I'm working always on deepening my consciousness, my love for hmm. you. And that requires addressing my imperfect. That requires facing my shame because right, right. I'm always doing things that are shameful that, yeah. that, that need to be healed. And so <laughs> the choice is you can stick with the latter marriage, or the, the, excuse me, the former marriage, and have kind of a parallel relationship. Or you can choose to engage in the friction. Mm, and I think yeah. that you do. And I believe yeah. that I'm committed. Angela, I believe that you're committed to this. And there you have a possibility. I guess we translate this into a different term from Jung, mm -hmm. is that the marriage provides a context in which you can experience, his term for it was individuation. Carl Jung called it individuation. Uh, Guggenbrill Craig calls it salvation, basically transformation, mm -hmm. is that you know that you're not the same person that you were last year right. or two years ago or three mm -hmm. years ago, owing to what you're learning and what, 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 what's transforming is the function of your love for your wife. Yeah. And, and you know that's the case for me as well. And yeah. so this would be an argument for doing just exactly what you talked about. We'll yeah. be going deeply into this next week. The entire session will be uh, focused on how do we build self-compassion and the idea with self-compassion is self-compassion can heal shame. Mm, yeah. You can't heal shame if you're just pissed off all the time. <laughs> so you have to acknowledge that some of that anger is a cover for shame. And we've tried to do that today. And then now let's see if we can go down through anger and resentment, down into that shame, and mm. see if we can find a way next week to discuss how do you begin to heal, step by step, day by day, the shame that keeps us imprisoned. Mm. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Odie. I appreciate always your presence you. here today. Yeah. Thank you, Anytime. Austin. Thank you, Beginnings, for hosting us. Uh, thank you all for participating. Thank you, our third uh, co-presenter, Angela. I appreciate very much your presence today. If anyone has any questions or comments, I uh, encourage you to, to send those to Austin, who forward those. You can also go to my website, just my name, drbobweathers.com, and send me any comments that you have. I'd be happy to respond. I hope that you'll come back. We'll be meeting the day after Christmas next Wednesday, uh, working on building self-compassion. I also want to move forward in two weeks. We have a guest from uh, Switzerland who will be actually joining us from Switzerland. And he's one of the uh, uh, primary holistic dentists in Europe. And you go, holistic dentists? Well, you have to come back and find out. And so <laughs> we'll be discussing addiction and recovery from a holistic perspective. Interestingly, this will be from somebody who's coming from a medical slash dental perspective. And I encourage you to join us. That particular session will be a few hours earlier than usual. And we're doing that out of respect to Tomas's time in Central Europe. And so next week, we'll meet at our regular time, 3 mm -hmm. p.m. Pacific. The following Wednesday, this will be the day after New Year's. The following Wednesday, we'll be meeting at 10 a.m. Pacific. So adjust your time uh, pieces for that. I'd love for you to join us. Uh, he's, uh, he's written one book on holistic dentistry, and he's currently working on completing a book on looking at uh, men and spirituality. And so we'll have plenty to talk about that session. Look forward to you joining us. Um, I, 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 uh, next week, Austin is going to be gone. I wish you Godspeed in your vacation plans, Austin. And uh, we hope that all of you will have uh, happy holidays the next week or two. Uh, come back and join us next Wednesday with Odie and me, okay? Thank you. Take care. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye for now.